So just a, a little more background about me. I'm Jay Hayek. I'm the Extension Forester at the University of Illinois. So I'm uh, on, on campus. I'm in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences there on campus. Prior to that, I had a small career, a uh, small career. I had a short-lived career with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources as a DNR forester. So when that ship began to sink, I jumped ship and went over to the University of Illinois. I love it. I'm an alumnus of the University of Illinois. And uh, this is one of the favorite parts of my job is getting out and uh, reaching out to the general public and educating. And I get to meet a lot of awesome people. I really do. And uh, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. There's going to be a lot of material. All right, there's a lot of material, even though we're only talking about barks, barks, bark and buds, and get my singulars and plurals right, but there's some terminology that you're going to have to become proficient in in order to help you navigate some of these keys. How many people have, you know, tree ID books, tree finder books? Yeah, so a lot of times there's terminology in there, right? I mean, what does this term mean, imbricate? Okay, well, we're going to talk about some of that terminology and just let you know that some authors, they'll use different words to mean the same thing. So we'll try to touch on a couple of those, but again, this is a 15-week college course stuffed into 50 minutes, okay? So it's going to be a little overwhelming, but I'm going to try to take care of you. We're going to have some pictures on there. Can you have some credits? Maybe, yeah. You know, University of Phoenix, there's, yeah, the online, sure. Yeah. Not to offend anybody, I mean, I mean it's, it's a valid, it's, you know, accredited university. All right. I don't want to get myself into trouble. All right, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about some essential terminology. And because this is a small enough group, I, I like to walk around when I talk. It allows me to, you know, interact a little better. So... You can watch me, watch the slides, whatever. So, principal ID techniques. Obviously, we're going to talk about bark. It's in the title. We're going to talk about buds and twigs. You can't talk about one without the other. We're also going to discuss some of uh, these tree ID guides, these winter tree ID guides, what I think are some of the best. And they're really, really affordable. And I'm going to save that at the end because that's part of my kicker. Some of these books are $3 and they are outstanding. Awesome, awesome tree ID books. And then we'll just wrap it up with a brief summary. So again, I, I, I talked about this briefly. This is 50 minutes, okay? I, there's only so much information I can talk about. But at least this will get you down the right path. And that's what it's all about. At most universities, tree ID, what we call dendrology, is the study of trees, dendro, tree, ology, the study of. I mean, it's a one to two semester course at most universities. Again, I just want to preface this talk where there's a lot of information, and this is as superficial as I can get it, but it's still going to be pretty in-depth. With plant classification, we utilize this binomial system. A lot of people call it Latin, right? You've got to learn about plant taxonomy and Latin. Well, it's not all Latin. Most of it's actually Greek, of Greek origin. What we do is we Latinize it, all right? We take an English word or we take a Greek word and we try to Latinize it. That's what the botanists and taxonomists used to do. But ultimately, plant names have a generic name or a genus. An example is oak, okay, Quercus. It's just one of those things. Quercus means all of the oak species, okay? And then the specific epithet, otherwise known as the species name, in this example, Alba, so Quercus, Okay, we know it's oak, and it alba, white. It's the white oak, and that's the native, uh, that's the state tree of Illinois. So you put those together, the generic name and the specific epithet, boom, you had the binomial. All right, Quercus alba. That name is known worldwide. There is only one Quercus alba. And the reason why that's important is because a lot of trees go by multiple common names. I'm going to give you an example. There's a tree called American Hornbeam. It's also known as Blue Beach. It is also known as Musclewood. Three commonly used names. It gets very confusing. But if we say Carpinus Caroliniana, that's all of it, okay? And it sounds really cool, too. You impress a lot of people, okay? You got a, you know, a date. You got, you know, you're taking out your wife. 
whomever, I mean, husband, you know, really impresses a lot of people when you say Carpinus. Actually, it doesn't. It hasn't worked for me, but. <laughs> Principal ID techniques. What, how we utilize, or what techniques we utilize for plant identification. And believe it or not, a tree is a plant, right? It's a woody plant. All right, so typically what we do by leaves, we ID by flowers, especially the hawthorn species. Who's here, who here is familiar with hawthorn? You know, they got the thorns on them, hawthorn, okay? There's over 60 native hawthorn species to Illinois alone. And some of them, they don't even have common names. It's just a binomial name. And the only people who know it are these botanists that study the rose family. And they only ID the tree by the flowers. Well, how often does a tree or plant flower? It's a very short window. So for two weeks out of the entire year, you have the opportunity to identify these hawthorn trees. So flowers become important, but obviously we're not going to talk about that in winter tree ID. Bark, we're going to talk a lot about bark. All right, bark's always there. If there's bark's not there, it's a dead tree. And why the heck are you going to identify a dead tree anyway? Twigs are available year round. We talk about, we're going to talk about leaf arrangement, how the leaves, leaves or buds are oriented along the main axis or axis of a twig. And that's what we call bud or leaf arrangement. We're also going to examine the pith. So if we take our knife and slice open a twig, inside of that is what we call a pith. And there's chambered pith, diaphragm pith, hollow pith. So by looking at just the pith of a tree, that'll help us get down to the species level for some, like oak, or some genuses, okay? So, okay, I know I'm in the right genus, but I want to get down to the specific species. So understanding the pith and knowing how to interpret it will help you key out a tree. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to key out a tree to be able to nail it on the head and say, hey, this is a black gum, or this is a persimmon, or this is a flowering dogwood. Fruit, if the tree is mature enough, now some tree species have male trees and female trees. Who here is familiar with Kentucky coffee tree? All right, Kentucky coffee tree. There's male trees and there's female trees. How about persimmon? Who's ever eaten a persimmon? You've probably seen them in the store. Male trees, female trees. Hedge or Osage orange, male tree, female tree, okay? So if it's not producing, it's not because it's not sexually mature yet, it's because it's a male tree. Natural habitat and native range, that's helpful. Um, species like shagbark hickory and shellbark hickory, they look almost identical to each other, but shellbark hickory is typically found in the floodplains, or shagbark hickory is typically found in the uplands, out of the floodplains. So in knowing the native habitat of a species, especially if it's in its native area, okay, if it's in your yard, well, that tree was intentionally planted by somebody, so the native habitat thing doesn't work for ornamental trees. And then form, we won't talk about form, so don't worry about it. What we're going to concentrate on is bark and twigs, and for some reason, we're not going to talk about fruit. I don't know why that came highlighted. All right, bark. So all bark and no bite. Laugh a little, a little, high, a little more. You've got, got to catch you on YouTube here. All right? Okay. okay. All right. So for bark appearance, what we're doing is we're looking at the surface texture and the surface pattern. Knowing the texture and pattern of the trees will really help you with tree identification. I ID 90% of trees, I've been doing this a while, by bark alone. All right? I don't have to look at the buds. I don't have to look at the fruit. I don't have to look at the leaves. I do almost all my timber work during the dormant season. There are no leaves. So I've had to build this visual, mental library in my head. I just, I take photographs with my eyes. I used to take photographs with, you know, your phone, or actually, I didn't even have a cell phone in college. I'm not super old and I'm not super young. But, I mean, it's just you, that visual, that visual library you have to create. You have to memorize it, okay? But the bark texture and the bark pattern can also, it also changes. For most species, bark texture and bark pattern will change with age and change with diameter. There's a few exceptions, like American beech. How many of you know, know what American beech looks like? Beech or American beech? 
it has very smooth bark. Doesn't matter if it's 50 inches in diameter or one inch in diameter. The bark almost always looks the same. For a lot of species, that is not the case. Bark thickness plays a role, but as a tree ages, usually the bark thickens, but it's not always the case. Perfect example, again, is American beech. American beech, the bark is always thin. Uh, there's always, because of genetics, you're always going to have some subtle variability. And usually, you see genetic differences when you look at bur oak in Iowa versus bur oak in southern Illinois. You can see some big genetic variability, especially with the fruit. Not so much the bark, but a lot of times with the fruit. Iowa bur oak, a lot of it's small where I've been down in the Kaskaskia River bottoms in southern Illinois, and they are tennis ball size. All right? So, different things. Color, bark color really helps, obviously, with, uh, you know, paper birch here. I mean, that's a, that's a tree that, you know, probably 90% of you are going to immediately be able to identify just by bark color alone. You know, it's thin, it strips here, a lot of people rip it off, they carve your name in there like American Beach. But, uh, you know, it's a very characteristic attribute. So a lot of times you don't need the twigs. You don't need the leaves. You can ID this tree any time. It's heavily planted as an ornamental. Okay? So color can also really come into play. Uh, kind of already talked about this. Young versus mature age trees. I'll give you an awesome example of red oak. We'll look at young red oak bark middle-aged red oak bark and old red oak bark. And you'll see, oh my gosh, how am I supposed to memorize all this stuff? It's, you have to, I mean, it's basically your memory. I mean, you just have to photograph it with your eyes. You really do. Some things are just rot memory. They really are. And growth rate. Some trees will display different morphology in their bark based on how fast they're growing. So it might not be genetics. It's just, is it on a growing, growing on a good site? Is it in competition with other trees? If so, that can somewhat affect the texture of the bark. So a lot of different things that come into play here. And I'll give you some examples. And we covered these. So some examples, some terminology of bark surface texture. So we're going to talk about some of the terms that are related to bark surface texture. Ridges. Ridges are vertical crests divided by furrows. And furrows, think of valleys, and ridges are just like a mountain ridge. It's what sticks out. It's more prominent. Where a ridge is that trough, that valley. And then some trees uh, have what we call fissures. Fissures are kind of cracks or crevices in the bark. It's also like a mini trough or a mini valley. And I see some of you writing, that's awesome, I encourage notes, that's super cool, you can take photos, but again, if I advance through the slide too quick and you didn't write everything down, it's going to be available to you, okay? So on the left, we have an example of a, not a deeply furrowed and ridged bark, but this is white, eastern white pine, it's a more mature tree, so this is a typical kind of bark pattern for eastern white pine, Pinus strobus, which is native to Iowa, it's native to Wisconsin, it's native to Illinois. And so you can kind of see it. So this would be a ridge, and this would be a furrow. It's more prominent on this eastern cottonwood on the right. Very typical bark for a mature specimen tree. Very pronounced ridges. Gosh, how much coffee did I have today? And <laughs> furrows, all right? So very typical bark pattern on the, on the right for eastern cottonwood. But at a young age, I mean, obviously the bark of that tree doesn't look that way. So that's age related. Here's an example of white oak, go back to our Illinois state tree. This is what we classify as broken horizontal ridges. So these ridges and furrows are not as pronounced as they are in the cottonwood example, right? Not nearly as pronounced. But you'll see that they have, this is what we mean by horizontal ridges so that you get these little bars that break that break the continuity of that long vertical ridge okay that's what we're talking about when we say horizontal or broken horizontal ridges is everyone can everyone see that so some tree species especially ash white ash and green ash we identify 
We call these, it has a diamond shape intersect, intersecting ridges. So it's a diamond pattern, okay? Very prominent on white ash, very prominent on green ash. So those are key indicators for identifying those two species. And then on the right, um, this is a common hickory in Illinois, not so much probably uh, in Iowa or Wisconsin, but mockernut hickory. And this is a mature mockernut hickory, and it kind of has, see how these ridges will kind of, they do intersect. This one kind of goes at an angle here, and they kind of form, just go with me, right? They form a diamond pattern. If you don't see it, make yourself see it, <laughs> all right? Believe me, it's a diamond pattern. It is. Okay. So very helpful for identifying those species. Here's a, this is an awesome classic example of chestnut oak, and you really get to see very prominent ridge, very prominent furrow, okay? And I believe, and this is my opinion, we, don't, uh, we do have some chestnut, native chestnut oak in very southern Illinois. You guys don't get it up here. But if you go to you know, Pennsylvania and the Appalachian region, you get a ton of chestnut oak. And to me, it looks like eastern cottonwood growing on ridges. I mean, it, the bark looks like cottonwood to me. It does. So when I see this tree in the mountains, you know, it's like, oh, that looks like cottonwood, so I know that's chestnut oak. So these are just little things you do, little games you play in your own mind to just remember things. But, you know, it's just, this is typical. This is typical chestnut bark. It always looks like this as it's a mature tree. All right, so I, like, I really like this slide. This gets to show you that age-related variability on bark texture. It's like, oh my God, how am I, you know, and a lot of trees display this. Young juvenile trees, the bark looks one way. Middle-aged trees, oh man, that's okay, a little different. And this is the mature tree. These are all northern red oak trees, okay? This is probably 28 to 36 inches in diameter. This is 12 to 14 inches in diameter. This is four to six inches in diameter. That's a lot of, that's, you know, morphologically, I mean, that's a huge difference, right? Very pronounced, so now you gotta memorize three different bark textures for one species. That's the name of the game. That's just the way it is. If it were easy, everyone would be a tree ID expert. And it's a really awesome slide because I, I took those pictures too. <laughs> fissures, I'm not gonna hit this uh, real hard, but this is what the definition of a fissure is. So this is northern red oak in this little pinkish, I call it pink orange. So it's this valley area and basically, it's the bark, the, as the growth rate of this tree is increasing, the bark is actually breaking apart. Okay, it's like, you know, it's get, the tree's getting bigger. All right, it's growing. And this is very prominent in fast growing red oak trees. Is that like a stretch mark? It is. Yeah, that's right. And ultimately, this fissure becomes a furrow, a more pronounced furrow. But right now, this is a more juvenile stage. So it's what we call a fissure. And fissures become furrows. So we're gonna go from ridges and furrows, now we're gonna jump to smooth bark, okay? Basically it lacks furrows, it lacks ridges, or other similar features. It's just, it's smooth, all right? It's real simple, it's smooth. Then we have trees that are platy. They're more platy in appearance, all right? And usually this platy appearance occurs as a tree matures, gets bigger, gets older. Classic examples of platy bark, shag bark hickory. All right, that's a platy bark tree. That's what we call it. That's how we refer to its bark texture. Smooth bark, American beech, classic. Doesn't matter how big that tree is, the tree always has smooth bark. If it doesn't have any bark, it's a dead beech. This is a tree that we have a lot in Illinois. I, I'm sorry, I'm from Illinois, so a lot of my examples are Illinois. I apologize for that. So I'm not sure if you guys have a lot of Carpinus caroliniana. This is the tree I mentioned that has three common names, mussel wood, blue beech, and American hornbeam. All right, this tree always has this smooth bark. My dendrology professor at the University of Illinois said it's Arnold Schwarzenegger's arm. All right, real muscular, mussel wood. I mean, that's, 
how it got one of its common names. All right? We have that in, well, central and southern Illinois. I'm not sure about northern Illinois. I'll be able to look at the map distribution and, and, t and tell you that. Not right now. If you email me. All right, classic. Classic shag bark hickory. All right, platy bark. It's brother or sister. I'm not going to play the sexist card here. Or sister. Shell bark hickory. All right, this tree is typically found in floodplains or, uh, or, or uh, flatwoods. Flatwoods are forests that have perched water tables. So if you have a really high water table, you can get shell bark hickory as well. But typically a floodplain tree, typically an upland tree. Look very similar, both classic examples of platy bark. Platy bark. This, we talked about white oak with the broken horizontal ridges. We kind of saw an example of this already. Very common. But this feature, this bark pattern, is also very common on white oak. Okay? You can have this bark pattern on the lower 12 feet and then develop this bark pattern 16 feet and higher on the same tree. It's like, oh man, now you have to memorize juvenile bark patterns, but on the same tree you can have different bark texture. It's a lot of information. But it's cool. I mean, trees are cool. Uh, peeling bark or exfoliating bark is another terminology. Scales, so you can have bark that's scaly, and you can have bark that's flaking. And here's some examples. This is another term that my, uh, my dendrology professor coined, and it's awesome, I, I remember. Burnt potato chips. Basically, ex you know, think about burnt potato chips and gluing them onto a tree. That's black cherry. That's a burnt potato chip tree. That's black cherry. It's classic. So if you remember this, you'll, you'll never forget it now. Like, that's burnt potato chips. I remember when Jay said that. That's awesome. I'll remember that for the rest of your life. You'll be able to pass it on to your grandchildren, your children, so on and so forth. This is ironwood or eastern hop horn beam. Flaky bark. All right? Whether it's juvenile or mature, most ironwood has this characteristic flaking bark. On the right, river birch, peeling bark, you know, strip it off, so on and so forth. So most people are familiar with uh, river birch and paper birch. They're very classic examples. You usually can identify those trees readily. American sycamore, I mean, that's one of those trees, especially in the floodplains, along rivers, along streams. On the lower part of the tree, it's very mottled. It's very flaky. But as you move up the stem of that tree, what color does it turn? Almost prominently. White. Yeah, you, get to see, you can identify that tree from you know, 500 yards away. From aerial imagery. You go on the Google Earth, you can find the sycamore trees in the floodplain. Because it's that prominent. Uh, lenticels are these horizontal lines. Um, how about yellow birch? People familiar with yellow birch? So those trees, especially at a young age, these lenticels, these horizontal lines on the tree are very prominent. Uh, plums, very prominent. You get these horizontal lenticels on plums and cherries, very prominent. So they'll help you with identification. Shredding fibrous bark, uh, think about eastern red cedar, classic example of uh, shredding or fibrous bark texture. And then corky bark, and I'll show you an example and you'll say, oh, I know exactly what corky bark is. This is a yellow birch here, an example. These little horizontal lines here, if you can, those are those kind of, that's what we're talking about for that river birch. Believe me, they're there. And then blocky bark. How many people are familiar with persimmon? Some people call that the alligator bark tree, all right? You know, it's like the back of an alligator, it's blocky. Persimmon, I mean, it's just, you see that bark texture, and boom, you should immediately think of persimmon. Now, I've seen some black walnut trees that develop that bark texture. And when you see black walnut with this persimmon type bark texture, it means that black walnut is growing on a really poor site, or it's growing really slow, one or the other. One typically leads to the other. Poor site leads to slow growth. But we'll see a lot of black walnut with that blocky bark texture. Hackberry, 
those wart-like projections. So when we talk about corky bark, we're talking about those warts that are common to young, uh, juvenile growing hackberry trees. As a hackberry tree matures, these features become less prominent, okay? But, you know, trees that are probably under 20 inches in diameter, they have these little warty features, and behind those warts, I mean, this is relatively smooth in here, but then you have those, you know, projections, those warty projections. And boom, when you see that, you should immediately think hackberry. There's no other tree like it, except one, which is called sugarberry, and you pick that up in southern Illinois. It's one of those uh, Mississippi Delta type species. And sugarberry and hackberry, they're separate species. They really are. The only way to key those out that I know of is the color of the fruit. Sugarberry fruit will typically be this orangish purple, where hackberry is just purple. Okay? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, so the shredding, peeling bark on the right, eastern red cedar, classic example of what we classify as shredding or peeling bark. Different authors are going to refer to it differently in whichever book they author, okay? Twigs and buds. So we're going to talk briefly, again, I only have so much time. Terminal buds, we're going to talk about lateral or axillary buds. Those are the buds on the side of the, of the twig. Terminal bud is at the terminal end, the very end, okay? You don't get terminal beds along the axis of a twig. That's where you get lateral buds. Lateral buds belong on the long axis. Terminal buds belong at the end. We're going to talk about what a bud scale scar is, what a leaf scar is. Talk about bundle traces, bundle scars, nodes and inner nodes. You know, a node is wherever a bud occurs. The distance between two buds is called an inner node. It's in between. The distance in between two buds is the inner node. Real simple. Lentisol, uh, I'll show you a picture of what a lentisol is, and then we'll also talk about the pith. And pith relates to twig. So if we cut open a twig, we'll be able to examine the pith. And that will help us get down to the species level on certain trickier species, if you will. Here's a line drawing of a buckeye twig, Ohio buckeye, Asculus glabra. At the very end, we have the terminal bud. On this bud are bud scales that helps protect the bud. Protect it from what? Well, deer. deer browsing, also from desiccation, right? Drying out, you need to protect that. Think of it like shingles on a bud. It's protecting what's inside. And what's inside a bud? Flowers, leaves, new twig growth, okay? Very important material for a plant, right? You got to protect it somehow. Not all buds have scales. Some have many, some have two, some have none. None means naked. So if you, you know, in your, in your books and you're reading naked bud, you just got to know that means it has no bud scales. And I'll show you an example, witch hazel. Witch hazel is an example of a tree or a shrub. It's a small tree, shrub. It has naked buds. Lentisols are on the side, the axis along the side axis. All, sometimes they're very prominent, sometimes they're very abundant, and sometimes they're very few. But lentisols are just another way for a tree to exchange air, okay? Here you have a, side, or a lateral bud or axillary bud. Here you have a leaf scar. This is where, you know, the petiole, the base of a, of a leaf stalk, we call it a petiole. That's the fancy name. You can call it leaf stalk. That's cool. It's called a petiole, all right? If you want to, you know, we're being technical here. So when you rip that off a tree, it leaves a scar, all right? Just the way they're oriented, the way they look, if they're round, if they're crescent-shaped, will help us with identification. And within a leaf scar are these little dots. Those are called vascular bundle traces. Those serve a purpose, okay? What do leaves do? Okay, well, the main thing is photosynthesis, right? So that photosynthate has to get down to the tree somehow. That's all transported through these little bundle traces, all right? Those are helpful for tree identification purposes. Some are very pronounced. In other species, they are not. Terminal bud scale scar. 
this little folded, I mean, it looks like folded skin on a twig. Basically, the distance from here to here is one year's growth. You can see how fast your yard tree is growing by examining these, these uh, terminal bud scale scars. The distance between those two is how much that particular twig grew in one year. So back in 2012 and 2013, and if you measure your trees, a lot of them are one to two inches. It was drought year. So you can kind of be a dendrochronologist and kind of grow that tree backwards in time and find out what the climate was like. But sometimes it's not climate induced. Sometimes it's competition. You know, you go out in the forest and there's a lot of other trees there. Well, I mean, you can see what the growth competition is by looking at some of these, uh, you know, bud scale scars, the distance between them. Okay? So this, is, this was a node. A node, the distance in between is an internode. Lateral axillary bud, leaf scar, we covered that. Pretty cool, copacetic, Verstanzi, yeah? All right. All right, finally some more kind of uh, photographic examples. This is a butternut classic leaf scar. Now they say this, uh, we learned it as a monkey face, you know, kind of an eye, eye, mouth. You know, walnut and butternut, it just has this kind of monkey face appearance. It's just, it stuck with me. It's, my, it's what my dendrology professor said. And, all right, you know, I, I, I can see it. I, I'll do it. So classic example of butternut. Here's a big leaf scar. It's very circular in shape. It's very prominent in size, and that's for catalpa. Catalpa, I mean, that's just what it looks like. And, the, and on top of that uh, leaf scar is an axillary bud. Here's an example of a, uh, this is a red maple. This is a lateral bud, leaf scar, three, you know, prominent bundle scars, okay? Very helpful with tree identification, really is, especially during the dormant season. For buds, we're going to talk about arrangement, position, size, shape, and color, all very helpful tools, all very helpful tools. We're going to go through it quick, okay? Bud arrangement, it's how the leaves, how the leaves are oriented around a twig. Are they staggered, which means alternate? Are they the buds opposite of each other on the twig. And this will be really easy because I'm going to show you some actual examples. World, basically you have three buds that are wrapped around the twig. They're all opposite of each other, but there's three of them. Instead of two that are opposite, there's three of them that are all opposite. We call that world. There's only one tree species I know of that has world. It's catalpa. And then you have something called sub-opposite. A lot of authors in their uh, tree ID books and their keys they don't even use the term sub-opposite. But the reason why I've resurrected it is because buckthorn has become a huge problem. Now, it's been a huge problem. But buckthorn has sub-opposite bud or leaf arrangement. All right. So this is a bad example. I got, I got, I'm going to change this slide. But here's an example of bald cypress. So basically, you have a bud, you move up, and you have another bud. That is an alternate leaf or bud arrangement on a twig. Here's sugar maple twig. You have a lateral bud on one side, directly opposite, directly opposite. You have another leaf scar and you have another bud. Opposite trees, there's only so many species or so many, there's a select genus. There's you know, about 10 that are opposite. It really helps with tree ID. If you come across a twig and it has opposite leaf arrangement. I mean, you got a 1 in 10 chance of being right, at least to the genus level. Here's our world. This is catalpa. So basically you have a lateral bud, lateral bud, lateral bud. The world, they're all opposite around the same axis. And here's our buckthorn example. This is our sub-opposite. A lot of times with sub-opposites, I mean, there's just a slight minute offset. A lot of times the buds will look directly opposite of each other, but you have to look at sometimes several buds along one twig, and then you'll notice that, oh, 75% of them are sub-opposite, 25% are opposite, but because the majority are sub-opposite, then it can't be an opposite species. Does that make sense? Yep. That makes sense when it came out of my mouth. I don't know. It's a turkey talking. So what we do is we come up with these aids, all right, mnemonic, mnemonic devices. 
And this is one that I learned in school. Now, I, I'm going to take credit for this. A vibrant cat. That's what I've added to it. So that's mine. It's copyrighted. Okay? So Mad Buck and Vibrant Cat. That will help you identify those species of trees that are oppositely leaf arrangement, bud arrangement. Maple for M. All maple species are opposite. Box elder, red maple, silver maple, sugar maple, they are all opposite. Ash. We have five native ash species in Illinois in the Midwest. You have white, you have black, you have blue, you have green, and then the weirdo is pumpkin. All right, pumpkin ash. Those are all opposite. Every dogwood except one. There's always got to be that one. All right. Every dogwood except one is opposite. Anyone have an idea of what the one non-opposite dogwood is called? Alternate, Alternate leaf dogwood. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Or pagoda dogwood. Some people call it pagoda dogwood. Buckeye. Buckeye also includes horse chestnut. Horse chestnut is thrown into the buckeye family. Okay, so your Ohio buckeye, yellow buckeye, uh, and red buckeye. Well, we, those are our three native buckeyes in Illinois. Up here in Iowa and Wisconsin, do you guys have any native buckeyes? Any native ones? No? Okay. Viburnums, all viburnums are opposite. So that's a very helpful aid. Most viburnums are shrubs, small trees, okay? Catalpa is our one world specimen. And there's a couple other ones. Elderberry. Uh, elderberry is becoming really popular for planting. Bladder nut and button bush, those three kind of shrubs, shrubby, woody shrub species, those are all opposite as well. Bud position, where those buds occur on a twig. We've killed terminal bud to death. It's on the end, okay? Terminal buds are on the end of the twig. It's just where they're located. Lateral or axillary buds are along the side, along the axis, along the long axis of a twig. And we have something called pseudo-terminal, pseudo-terminal buds. They're at the very end, but they're slightly offset. They're slightly cockeyed. That's a great way to ID basswood. Basswood and pseudo-terminal bud, just remember it. That's how basswood is. You have a lot of basswood up here. We also have something called superimposed buds. Uh, the, the hickory and walnut species, those have uh, superimposed buds. I'll show you examples of those. And then these uh, accessory buds. And uh, a lot of the oaks, if you've ever looked at an oak twig, man, it is just loaded with buds. It's got a ton of buds clustered at the terminal end. And then along the side, it's just, it's just full of buds. All right, you know, why? A lot of those accessory buds are going to produce flowers. Now look, those you know, catkins you know, produce basically acorns, right? All right, so here's some bud position examples. On the far left, this is a lateral bud for an American basswood. One end is the, this is a pseudo-terminal, because what we have here is a leaf scar. So that's why it's called a pseudo-terminal bud. It shared something else up here at the terminal end. Classic example, you should never misidentify this tree. It is the only tree. It's bitter nut hickory. It is the only yellow, sulfur yellow bud tree. That's it. You ever see this bud, it has to be bitter nut hickory. It's one of our native hickories. It's very abundant and very common. All right? I mean, as a sapling, you should be able to identify this tree all year round, just from its bud. It's the only one that looks like it. Then on the far right, we talked about this cluster. This is a, you know, this is a chinkapin oak, and you can just see all those buds at, on the terminal end of that twig. It's just a massive cluster of buds, all right? Some are going to be fruit, some are going to be twigs, some are going to be leaves. I mean, it's just the way it is. So briefly, I talked about superimposed. All it means is there's a big bud on top of a, another bud, right above the axle, uh, you know, the axis, the long axis of a twig. This is a butternut. 
And it's just what we call, it's a classic example of what a superimposed bud looks like on a twig. And then on the right is what the pith of a butternut looks like. And we'll talk a little bit more about pith and what some of the definitions are. But very dark, very chambered, very hollow inside. Hollow but chambered and very dark. It's a great way to identify butternut. And then I'll show you a side-by-side -side comparison of butternut and walnut and the difference between two of them. Because they can become very difficult to ID at a very young stage. But as those two trees mature, the bark looks absolutely different, and there's no way you should ever confuse the bark. Uh, I think we've killed pseudo-terminal. Bud scales, almost all tree species have bud scales, but there are some that are naked. Some species have many bud scales, others have two, others have none. But most species have multiple bud scales on their lateral and terminal buds. Bud scales come in several flavors, imbricate. Just think about uh, the layers of shingles on your roof. That's how those bud scales are layered on top of each other, okay? Valvate, think of a clamshell coming together. Basically, you have one bud scale and one bud scale, and they kind of form a clam shape over top of the, of the delicate material. That's what it's doing. So it's basically just two scales that have come together. Capped uh, is common for sycamore, and then naked, you know, this is witch hazel. It's a classic example of a naked bud scales. There are no bud scales. So here's valvate. You have one bud scale, one bud scale. They're pressed together, almost in a, almost a fused pattern. This is yellow poplar or tulip poplar. Imbricate, this is sugar maple. So basically you have bud scale, bud scale, bud scale, bud scale, bud scale. It's that overlapping, that's that kind of, you know, shingle effect, protecting that, you know, vital vegetative, you know, material, what might be a flower, okay? And then on the far left, this is our hit, witch hazel, that's naked. There are no bud scales. So actually, it's not two fused together, there are none, okay? I love this slide. I wish I had taken it. I might have to do it sometime. But these are some of our native hickories. This is shell bark hickory, huge bud, huge bud for a shell bark hickory. Even the lateral buds are big. What's this guy? Bitter nut. Bitter nut. Remember it. Don't forget it. It's always that color. It's the only one. You'll always get that tree right. It's a bonus. Next we have pig nut hickory. How many have heard of pig nut hickory? All right. That's pig nut hickory, carry glabra. How about mocker nut hickory? It's a little bigger than pig nut, but smaller than shag bark hickory. This guy's shag bark. You can see the difference between shell bark and shag bark. You thought shag bark hickory buds were big. Shell bark's bigger. It's helpful for tree identification purposes. How about differentiating white ash from green ash? It's a very common question. By the bark, the trees look very similar. But by the leaf scars, we're able to identify them down to the species level. This is what we call crescent shaped. It's like the shape of a half, you know, a crescent shape of a moon. Think of it like that. Crescent shaped moon, the color of the moon is typically white, white ash. All right, follow me, right? Yeah, you're getting it, you're getting it. And the, yes, this is crescent shaped. I'm calling it crescent shaped, so it's crescent shaped. It's buddy over here, green ash, has a more of a D-shaped. Go with me, it's D-shaped, it's just the way it is, it's D-shaped. That's green ash. So just by the style of this leaf scar, you can differentiate white ash from green ash, just by the twig, boom, you're done. One more thing, some trees have what we call stipules. Stipules are small leaf-like appendages at the base of petioles, or the base of a leaf stalk. Some species have it, most don't. So these are what we call stipules. This is yellow poplar or tulip poplar tree. So at the base of that petiole, this is a petiole, are these stipules, and there's evidence of them when that leaf falls. 
right here is a stipular scar. So by seeing that, you can identify that species. So we have a leaf scar, lateral bud, stipular scar. All very helpful tools, OK? How are we doing on time? I'm just, I'm terrible at time. I'm going to keep you here forever. 15 minutes? OK. Gosh, I'm doing, I actually might get through my presentation. This might be a record. Yeah, all right, yeah. Twig pith. All right, so pith is just the central portion, if it's there, because sometimes it's absent, it's hollow. But it's the central portion of a twig, and it's, uh, you know, this fancy term, it's called parenchyma cells. All right, it's just, don't worry about it. Just, it is what it is. But the, the pith can be solid, or what we call continuous. It can be diaphragmed and continuous. It can be chambered. It can be spongy. Or it can be gone, excavated, hollow. Bush honeysuckle, classic example. You cut into a twig of a bush honeysuckle, there is no pith. It's hollow. It can be very helpful for tree identification or shrub identification purposes. So what does that look like, Jay? Well, I'll tell you. This is solid. This is what a solid pith in the diagram form. I'm going to show you actually real slides. But the, as a diagram, this is what continuous or solid. This is what diaphragm looks like. So diaphragm is also solid, but you get these horizontal partitions. That's what diaphragm. And then you have something called chambered. So it's hollowed, but you get these partitions. So this is solid with partitions, hollow with partitions. Very helpful for tree identification purposes with those hard to key out species. All right, solid pith, this tree of heaven, Ugh, ah, tree of heaven, hate it, right? Kill it. Solid pith, yellow poplar, this is diaphragmed, all right? You can see those partitions, right? Horizontal partitions, yeah. but it's still solid. The buddy over here chambered, this is black walnut. You got those horizontal partitions, but it's hollow inside. And this is completely hollow, nothing. That's our bush honeysuckle. Yeah, yuck. Hey, bush honeysuckle. Terrible stuff. So the difference between black walnut and butternut is. Oh, don't steal my thunder. Hey! Is that what you're gonna talk about? Yes. Oh man, I'm gonna play the lottery tonight. On top is butternut. Chambered. It's got those partitions. It's hollow, right? It's you know it's it's chambered, okay? It's hollow with partitions. Hollow with partitions, but it's really dark. Isn't that darker compared to this? So it's kind of weird, right? Black walnut, you think black walnut would be darker than butternut. Because some, what's another name for butternut? A lot of people call it white walnut. Well, it's white walnut because of its bark, not because of its pith. So a classic example, butternut. This is what butter, it's very dark. Black walnut, it's just lighter. It's a darker and this is a lighter chocolate. Same thing, butternut on top, black walnut here. This is very helpful when you have a two-year-old tree, a four-year-old tree, five-year-old tree, where it's not really showing its bark morphology, right? You just really can't tell yet. It's not producing fruit, but if you cut it open, you know, you have to do a little destructive sampling. That's how you can identify those two trees. Other things we can use, color, odor, taste. What's a classic example of an odor or taste twig? Sassafras. Sassafras, cedar, yeah. A, you know, black cherry has a very astringent, bitter almond smell to it. Uh, you, you're familiar with wafer ash or a common hop tree? Very pungent smell. So things like that, oh, uh, yellow birch that's very fragrant, got a wintergreen smell when you crack open its twig. So odor, taste, things like that can be very helpful. Uh, some twigs have a lot of lenticels. Sometimes they're mostly absent. Outgrowths or projections, wings or things like that. Blue ash, uh, Fraxinus quadrangulata. The twigs are four angled. That's what we mean by outgrowths. Bur oak, young bur oak twigs are really corky and and uh, we talked about the winged or angled. Uh, 
classic example of a young, fast-growing, vigorous bur oak twig. Very, these corky, wing-like projections. Not all bur oak have that, because sometimes genetics plays a role. But I see this a lot on uh, young uh, CRP tree plantings, where the bur oak will look like that. This is blue ash, one of our native ashes. Um, you know, it's quad, quadrangulata is a specific epithet. It got its name because of its twigs. They're four angled. That four angled is more prominent on last year's growth than two years ago. It becomes less and less prominent as that twig gains diameter and it's closer to the bowl or main stem of a tree. And then, of course, just, you know, just the general outward appearance. Some twigs are hairy. Um, some have this white, whitish coating, which is called glaucus. And uh, you know, there's, some are pubescent. Some are really hairy. And then some have thorns, spikes, or prickles. And believe it or not, they all have a certain definition. A thorn is not a spine. A spine is not a thorn. A spine is not a prickle, so on and so forth. They all have a certain definition. How do I know that? Because the botanist told me. Black locust has stipular spines. Hawthorn has thorns. <laughs> Honey locust has thorns. Prickles, think of your black raspberries, raspberries, those have prickles. That's what a prickle is, just think of raspberries. Honey locust, black locust, Osage orange also has armament. Devil's walking stick, prickly ash. Many of you are probably familiar with prickly ash. That has armament as well. Twig color, you know, box elder, sassafras. Uh, those are green. The youngest growth are always green. Red osier dogwood. What color twigs are the newest growth for red osier dogwood? Red. red. <laughs> yeah. Here's a box elder, you know. Current growth, last year's growth, very green, very prominent, real easy. Twig odor and taste, I love chewing on sassafras when I'm out in the timber. I mean, just grab, grab a fresh, uh, you know, current year's growth twig, pop it in my mouth, it's just like chewing gum. Yellow birch, very pleasant, wintergreen smell, black cherry, pungent, it's got that bitter almond smell to it. Spice bush, again, very aromatic, very pleasant. Common hop tree, stinks, terrible. Smell it once, you'll never forget it, all right? Very pungent. All right, and I'm almost done, got three sides left. All right, I was telling you, buy this, seriously. Go online, buy it, buy multiple copies. It's $3, it is awesome. Missouri Department of Conservation. This is one of the, field, or one of the guides we had to use for when I was in college to study twigs. Awesome, all right? Every species Missouri has, you're going to have up in Iowa, and, well, they're going to have more species than Iowa and Wisconsin. And it's great for Illinois, too, because we have almost all identical oaks. So this is great for oaks and hickories, but it has every other, you know, pretty much common species. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not going to go into too much depth with the conifers and stuff like that, and there's other tricks. But uh, this definitely goes into depth uh, regarding the twigs and buds and stuff like that. For three dollars, man, it's an awesome stocking stuffer, okay? So you can just Google it, whatever, but you can go to Missouri Department of Conservation, their nature shop. This is another awesome one, uh, Harlow. I mean, this guy, he's a dendrologist, he's a stud, and we had to use this fruit key and twig key. It is awesome because it also covers the fruit. <laughs> The acorns, the hickory nuts, what they look like, it's really good. And this, it's a classic, all right? This will always be a classic, and it needs to be in your backpack, and it needs to be on your bookshelf. It's that good. Uh, yeah, I, you know, because Missouri does have some native pines, especially like shortleaf pine, eastern red cedar, I, I'm not sure how in-depth with the conifers it goes into. But the hardwoods, for sure. The hardwoods are for sure. And hardwoods are typically more difficult because there's so many more, right? For $6.95, plus the shipping deal, whatever, but buy this book, it's awesome, okay? So it's uh, Dover Publications. I mean, that's, that's the publisher. 
And then, of course, you know, I heard this guy, he, he did a really good job with one of his, uh, edited one of his books. So, uh, yeah, Four Streets of Illinois. Hey, Beth, I think she's got a copy right, right in front of her. Yeah, there you go. Gotcha. Okay. So for ten dollars, for ten dollars, and none, and none of this money actually goes into my pocket, but it goes to the extension forestry program at the University of Illinois. So I de I derive no monetary gain. That's why I can prostitute myself a little bit up here. That's it. Oh, so yeah, it goes all the way up into yeah. northern Illinois. So Blue Beach, Musclewood, or American, Hop, American Hornbeam definitely goes into Wisconsin, and it goes into Iowa as well. So questions? Yes, sir. Bass tree puts a little is that It's called a nutlet. It's a nutlet. Yeah. Wildlife. And producing little baby trees. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, bird, mice, yes sir. They do, so bur oaks and white oaks will hybridize. They're very promiscuous, oaks and hickories, very promiscuous. Yeah. And is that a hybridized tree? Or is that if you can't identify, it's a hybrid. Okay. No, I'm not serious. I mean, if you can't identify it, someone will be able to identify it. And if they say it's a hybrid, more than likely it's a hybrid. But, I mean, it's, it would not be unusual. It is not uncommon to have hybrids, especially with oaks and especially with hickories. More so with oak. More so with oak. Is there a tree called rock elm around here? Yes, rock elm is a native elm. Olmus Thomasi. Well, it also has corky branches. Yeah. So the, the twigs themselves have this corky uh, so appearance to them. That was bur oak. No, the other one, the one that had the white, uh, white bark, smooth bark, the, the ridges on it, uh, and a horn beam or a muscle tree or something? Yeah, muscle wood, totally, yeah, different tree. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. In the, in the woods after the oak trees, mature oak forest, there's a bunch of tall, narrow trees. They're about six inches in diameter. And they all have their leaves on, and they're brown leaves. Are those an elm? It could be ironwood. Uh, so we call that marcescence or marquescence. And basically, there's certain genera that basically they maintain their leaves, especially as a juvenile tree. And we believe that's a trait to not to mitigate or minimize browsing. So basically, you maintain your foliage all year, and therefore the browsing animals can't get as easily to the, to the buds, right? Nip off all the buds, that sacrifices growth. So we call that marcescence, ironwood, uh, juvenile oak trees, and beech. Very common, especially the juvenile trees, to maintain that wilted, those wilted leaves year round. But they drop off as soon as the new foliage, that new, uh, they break dormancy in the spring. Yeah. Beech, ironwood, and oak. All right, good to go? Learn something? Excellent, good. I, I do not. I do not. So I was just putting a plug for it, but you can order it off our website, Pubs Plus. Pubs Plus? Pubs Plus. I have about 35 Tree ID books because I've yet to come across the perfect one. That's one of my you goals. Never, you never fail to buy one when you see it. That's right. No, I, I can. I'm, I'm addicted. My wife will say, you bought another tree. <laughs> yeah, I I'm addicted. Did you teach dendrology? Uh, not at the university. I'm going to resurrect the course. I'm going to bring it back. We haven't, been, we haven't taught it.